Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me, Don Chap, where we are going to go through character creation for The Witcher. Now, <clears throat> unlike my other videos where I'm going to go step by step of creating a whole character from scratch, um, I'm just going to go over this particular build, um, specifically because I'm going to be running a campaign shortly and one of my uh, players have decided to become a mage and has found it quite difficult to build a mage from scratch um, mostly when it comes to choosing the spells it seems not much is explained or perhaps reading is boring but nevertheless this is why I'm here to help you go through it because apparently there is no video to do this thing where you get to understand how mages work so we're gonna simply focus on the core rule book for now and then we're gonna go into tome of chaos just in case you have it so these are the two books you kind of want so the witcher um by cd project red and uh Telsorian games basically created this rpg system if you're not familiar with it um you should get yourself familiar with it if you have played cyberpunk red or cyberpunk uh any cyberpunk system to be honest this is very close simply because Toler uh Telsorian, sorry is the son of the creator of cyberpunk um so it's quite interesting seeing those mechanics being kind of made medieval i guess Without further ado, let's get into it. So basically, what we're talking about is your mage. Um, so you're going to go into the core rulebook and you're going to find your create your own character. You can go through the whole lifespan and things. Um, and it doesn't matter which race you pick, to be honest with you. Um, ideally, however, if you're playing true to the Witcher uh, content and stuff, you're going to be choosing either an elf or a human, most likely human. Remember, if you pick the Witcher as your race, technically speaking, you're only allowed to be a Witcher as a profession. So after you go into race, life path, you're gonna go to your profession and you're gonna go over to mage. This is found on page 42 of the book. If you have the physical copy, if you have the digital copy, it's just one number up, 43. So over here, we have a bit of an overview of what a mage is from Radolf Kazan's perspective. So the defining skill is magic training. So the reason why this is a defining skill is because when you're actually uh, spending IP, which is improvement points, which you will, it's a currency to upgrade everything on your character sheet, um, magic in itself is expensive for every two points of iep you get one in return so what this means is if you want to increase your magic from one to two you have to spend four ip points in order to upgrade it this way so it just makes things more difficult however seeing that you have magic training this cheats its way through because all you need is for every one you spend one. One is to one. Now, the most important thing you need to understand about magic is it is true to the nature of magic where um, if you're familiar with the Witcher world, the series, whatever it is, there is this thing called chaos, which is what drives magic in the first place. And the way we describe it in the game is um, you have your body is your instrument to perform magic now what this means is that you're channeling magic through you and your body can only take so much and this is what we have as vigor vigor is how much your body can process the chaos so with every turn um you can pretty much cast anything with five vigor or less anything above your vigor is going to start costing you in hp for every one HP, sorry, for every one stamina above your vigor, it's going to cost you five HP. So that's the long and short of how magic actually works in the game, which I think is a pretty cool concept. If you're familiar with like D&D, &D, um, it's all about spell slots. So this is when you notice that your 
um, character is exhausted to cast any more spells through the day. This is not quite the case for the Witcher. The Witcher will um, tell your character that you're exhausted because it's going to take stamina away from you. Now, you have stamina equivalent to how much you have HP. The difference is stamina the minute you go down to zero. You're KO'd. It's done. Your body can't take it anymore and you pass out. While HP, once it hits zero, you are dead, dead. Dead, dead. So, without further ado, we're going to carry on with how to build your mage. So, mage in specific will give you the magical perks of five novice spells, one novice ritual, and one low danger hex. So, this is what you pretty much start with in the game. And you can choose anything. Now, remember that vigor five, because that's going to be very important. Also, things you want to consider is your skill sets, which... You just mark them on your character sheet, and when you come to inserting points, you kind of want to remember this. Now, when it comes to the gear components, really and truly, um, as a mage, you have a um, certain understanding of brewing and technology. So remember, you are not some just any spellcaster out there just shooting whatever magic out of your palms. No, you are a very high intellectual individual and you should treat it as such. So what you're going to do at this point, once you filled out that part, unless you want to jump straight into it before you start picking anything else or going to the your statistics, at least, knowing that you have five vigor and you know exactly what you need for magic, you can just pop over into the magic section, go to mage spells, and that would be on page 102. So these are your novice spells, and they are categorized by elements. As you can see, um, the purpose of magical elements is simply where you're drawing from. And I, I really like this concept because it kind of tells you each spell where it's, it's actually originating from. This is very important when it comes to fumbling. If you fumble a magic try, so a, a skill check of sorts, this is where the game master is going to ask you or he's going to know from where it's driven from and he has a relevant response to that. So something like an earth spell where you're trying to um, create earthen spike, for example, which is this one right here which is going to cost you 5 stamina, which is the maximum you can have uh, cost in one turn from your vigor starting off. I like to keep this in mind, so it's like ingraining in there. So you try to create an earthen spike that creates an angled stalactite um, to stab the target. So basically it's just as, you know, out of the ground. Now the thing is this, if you fumble on this, depending on how bad you fumble, it can get really bad because remember magic is chaos so what would happen is usually you feel uh let's say you fumbled and fumbled pretty bad um it happened to one of my characters actually during a one shot where it, the surge went through the earth and you just see this ripple effect and as it extends the maximum length range which is five meters it kind of rushes back into her and knocks her out taking damage and knocking her prone so this is where we're at with magical elements. This is why you don't want, by the way, to mess too much with fire. This is why in the books and in, well, I don't think in the games it's really noticed as much, but I guess in the series, in the Netflix series, it's kind of noticed where fire is not exactly uh, a spell component, a spell element, sorry, that you want to mess with. Anyways, I'm digressing, so let's get into the spell. So basically, these are the set of spells you can choose, and there's quite a few of them. Actually, you, over here in the page before, the 102 page in the core book, you have all the name spells, and as you can see, there is pretty much um, seven spells from each element, and that includes mixed. So it's pretty much you go through and you kind of choose your five that makes sense to you. So, 
see what you might want to talk with your GM of what kind of campaign you're going to be doing, what you're be encountering most. Um, I know it's meta gaming to be honest, but the, the, the last thing you want to do is feel useless. You want to be u feeling useful. I'm really not getting these words in. Um, you want to feel useful during the campaign, and you don't want to end up stuck looking at your spells and going like, I don't know what spell to cast right now. And don't think of it too much as a combat scenario. Think of it in every scenario. You want to have that one or two spell that deals uh, some form of combat damage of sorts. However, don't restrict all five to um, your combat, I guess. So then we go to rituals. Now you're allowed one novice ritual. Um, and you can see you have nine novice rituals to choose from. You get to choose one of these. Um, and you see whatever is necessary. Ritual takes time. So ritual takes time. It takes resources. So something that you want to do when you're kind of on a downtime. So not something that you're doing on the spot. That is what ritual does. So it's, think of it in a moment of, um, I don't know, you're trying to cleanse a room. Uh, Hydromancy is one of the most popular ones that I find that is found on most of my player's character sheet. Simply because of this whole um, water thing. Is it, Think of it as the D&D version of, uh, what was it called? You know which one I'm talking about? Right? Anyways. <laughs> um, so yeah. It's pretty straightforward when it comes to it. You won't get to the journeyman rituals at any point. As you can see, they cost much more. 12. So this is like way into the campaign. Also, in relation to how do you get spells throughout your campaign is something you want to discuss with the GM. It is in the rule book how this is usually given. Usually you're finding books, you're researching, uh, or someone teaches it to you. You can teach spells to other mages that they don't have your spells. So you can be a group of mages and all of you have different spells and someone's like, listen, I really want to learn this one off you. Um, it, it is possible. So there's a whole section about it. I'm not going to get into this video. Um, this is where you should read. This is the whole point of it. We love reading and we do it well. Right. So then we go down to hexes. And hexes are pretty much established by their danger. And you can choose one low danger, which is pretty much between these two. Right. On page 121 from the core book, you have these two to choose from, from the core book itself. And it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a hex of sorts. And it's not endangering the individual at all. Hex of Shadows just brings someone like very paranoid of their shadows from my understanding. The Eternal Itch is my favorite one because you just make them itch constantly and just throws them off. Um, so, yeah, there's that. As you can see, hexes do get quite costly as you go up. Really and truly casting these things don't require much. There isn't actually too much of a requirement to cast it. It's easy to do hexes. Um, usually you just utter the word and it's done. Um, taking them off is another thing. It's it's easy to hex someone. Very hard or at least it's challenging to get rid of them. These are not curses, by the way. So don't mix hex with a curse. Not the same thing. Curses are much harder to lift. Curses such as uh, lycanthropy, so werewolf and such, um, and all that. So, in fact, I'm not even sure if it actually lists any curses here. Uh, there we go, learning magic. So, so to learn a new or low... It would take 10 IP. I guess while we're at it, we might as well learn this. Time to learn. It takes four days to learn how to really cast a spell. You're going to be doing a learning difficulty check of 14 every time. And uh, you get to do two learning checks. So you get to do this twice. 
to get there. All right. To get into the next one, the journeyman, medium, master high, archpriest, so on, you can see it requires more points to learn how to learn magic. Yay. So that's it for the magic part when it comes to the core rule book. However, what I will do is um, I will get into, if you would just bear with me, Tome of Chaos, which is the last book I believe that was published by these guys. Pretty heavy book, pretty interesting. But it's very magic-y base. So the spellcasters that we look at is the mage, the priest, and the druid. I don't think I'm missing anything else, but I'll find out surely. Um, there we are. Tomo Chaos. Apologies. There we are. The Witcher. Tomo Chaos. Beautiful art cover, must say. So... The difference between the core book and this one is in the core book you're going to go, I think it's the Witcher only as a profession and as a race itself that has its own life path. A mage does not have their own life path in the core book. However, when it comes to the Tomo Chaos over here, they finally said, hey, they go to schools and stuff, you know, they're trained how to become mages and so forth there are different schools of magic i guess and i'm not talking harry potter stuff here i'm talking about the actual heavy duty stuff where you're recruited on purpose because you're a person who can wield chaos and you're not allowed to stay in the world for long so in fact you have Aratusa, which everyone knows about if you're familiar with them bernard is quite popular in the book very rarely mentioned anywhere else. Um, Gwyson Hall, which is mentioned here. So, yeah. Anyways, go through this. Very interesting. Um, what I will tell you for sure is we're going to go through the mage. What is a mage? And it tells you all about it. The different mage schools. And here we have the mage life path. Which is something that I recommend. If you're going to play mage. You want to invest in this book. In one way or another. Um, and you're going to go through the mage's life path. Understand how you became recruited. Where you were coming from. How your training went. Your adventures into the continent. And so forth. As It's a long lengthy process. Because um, that's basically the background. Which I just showed you. And now we're going into the life of a mage. Um, and it works very similar to how a witcher is kind of created. So you're going to roll what danger you face in the world. Um, and you're going to go accordingly. So, yeah. By the way, you could roll on these or you could just pick them. I personally prefer rolling. It gives that spontaneousness. You don't really choose your life. Life is chosen for you. Now, why am I going through all this? Is because there are the relevant spells that you get. So, mage spells. You are given an additional amount of spells. Um, a number more mixed. So, we said we had seven in the other one. This gives you another four of the other elements. And an additional seven on the mixed and there's more to choose from it might be overwhelming but i love the addition of spells here it gives me more understanding broad wide understanding actually of how much magic i can learn and do so that there's that um and then obviously there are the novice rituals you're given another four novice rituals um, from the original, uh, what was it, 9, I think, yeah, so from the original 9, you get this one, um, Tyromancy, I think, yeah, Tyromancy is one of the most popular ones that I've seen, uh, where they can determine the outcome, so to speak, and then we have Hexes, Hexes, we're given another two Hexes here, 
Curse of Temperance and uh, Odious Hex. Curse of Temperance is quite fun because if you have a lively DM where he's introducing alcohol at every turn, every tavern, um, this is where you're going to make someone feel like they can't drink at all. If you have this annoying dwarf in your tavern, um, this is something you want to cast on them because they're going to be like, oh, I can drink so much. And you make, a co you know, you get into a competition, you just cast this curse on them. And they're going to notice something's up, by the way. It's not like something's funny, something's weird. Because they used to down things. Now with just a drop of alcohol, um, they feel the effects immediately of being drunk. They start to puke, um, dizziness and so forth. Uh, Diodius Hex, I guess, is more of a social standing. You become hated. So you kind of have to work the narrative on that one. So those are pretty much where you can go with building your mage. Remember, mages and other magic users, such as mentioned, which is the priest and the druid, um, are have different different vigor, which means they can only cast so many spells and so many rituals can be done. Um, however, they have a different effect and they have their own tree line as well. They have their own skill tree. So let's go into the skill tree really quick. I'm not going to get into too much detail. This is a magical skill tree. So you can go into politician, the scientist or the archmage. Usually most of the people, depending on the campaign, uh, if you're just adventuring, archmage is where you're going with. If you're adventuring, but you tend to stay around the town, it's scientists. If you have a high standard campaign where it's a lot of politic intrigue, the politician is usually where you want to go for. Um, again, this is the tree you can unlock as you go. And to unlock this is very similar to what I mentioned previously. There's IP required to spend to unlock these and they're not cheap. I believe it is 10, 20 and 30. Um, according to each one, plus whatever you need, um, you know, in your magical training as it goes. This is found on page 66 of the core rulebook, by the way. So that's pretty much on how to create, I guess, your spell list for a mage. I hope you found this video useful. Till next time.